Welcome to the Theology Podcast. It's great to have you here for another show. We've got a, uh, a special guest today that we're eager to talk to, and we'll let him introduce himself in a moment. We've been looking forward to this show for a little while now, and uh, it's going to be a, a fun conversation, I, I anticipate. But I'm C.R. Wiley. I'm a pastor of a church in the Pacific Northwest. I've been a professor of philosophy. I've been a real estate investor, and I have written a number of books, and the most recent book is In the House of Tom Bombadil. Okay, how about over to you, Tom? Tom Price. I teach systematic theology, uh, moral theology, and philosophy at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, and this is an exciting day for me uh, uh, to have Dr. Han be on, so uh, (laughs) <laughs> I'll unpack that later. All but, right. Uh, anyway, uh, All right. pass it to Glenn. <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm Glenn Sunshine. I'm a retired Reformation history professor at Central Connecticut State University. Been doing a lot of stuff with Worldview with uh, Chuck Colson. So I'm a senior fellow at the Colson Center for Christian Worldview and a ministry associated Reflections Ministries under Ken Boa in Atlanta. Great. And uh, Tom has already tipped our hand a little bit. We've got Dr. Michael Hamby with us. But uh, Michael, why don't you introduce yourself so that you can let folks know uh, just what they ought to know about you and maybe tell us uh, about your most recent publication. Sure. Well, um, first of all, thanks for for having me on. I'm really looking forward to uh, the conversation with you guys. But uh, uh, as you mentioned, my name's Michael Hanby. I, uh, I guess my title is uh, Associate Professor of Religion and Philosophy of Science at the John Paul II Institute at Catholic University in Washington. Uh, but what that title really means is just that I get to do a little bit of everything, um, <laughs> as a number of us here do. So my work really involves um, kind of the intersection between theology, the metaphysics of modern science, technology, politics, and you know, I spend most of my trying trying to weave those things together into some kind of intelligible whole. Um, and I've been here 15, 16 years, I guess. Um, and it's a, a wonderful place to live and work and, and study. And I've been really, really, really blessed by the opportunity. It's changed uh, my life and undoubtedly, you know, shaped the way I think about just about everything. A, a, a quick a quick question. Is, is Dr. Reinhard Hutter there? Uh, Dr. Hutter is at Catholic U in the theology department, uh, okay. which is we are where we are physically located, but we are, uh, you might say, at but not of uh, Catholic okay. University. We he, are he, was, he, was one, he was my thesis supervisor back at Duke, and so oh, he, he's oh. special special person to me. So you're, you're, me. you're a Duke grad as well. I did a yeah. An MDiv there back in the day. Um, uh, it's so, been a while now, so yeah, I'm that sure. explains a lot of affinity, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, anyway, no, I've known I've known Reinhard for years, and I I, I bump into him over there once in a while. But uh, uh, we are uh, really kind of an independent grad school. We have uh, um, an MTS program, uh, uh, a PhD program, and then their pontifical equi- equivalents, and. Um, uh, there's some, there's a little bit of, of cross listing and back and forth between our students, but for the most part, we you know we do our own thing. Nice, great. If I can, if I can make one observation before we start, um, most people would find the intersection of things like the metaphysics of science and the other subjects that you talked about and politics. They would find that a rather odd mix, but I think that that is exactly. Uh, the point of your uh, Touchstone conference presentation that in our modern world, everything gets tied to politics. So I thought that was a, a very interesting uh, collection of, of topics you picked, but given your presentation, it makes well, perfect sense. Thank you. Everything gets tied to politics, but the reverse side of that would be that everything, including politics, gets tied to technology. Um, and uh, and there's I think there's some deep underlying reasons for that that you know maybe we'll get into, but that's a... That's, uh, I uh, appreciate, I think that's an a, a astute observation. Well, uh, speaking of the conference that uh, you spoke at, it, we're talking about the Touchdown Conference that uh, took place uh, recently in Chicago. And uh, I was there and uh, really found your talk uh, captivating and challenging. And, and the subject matter is something I've been thinking a lot about lately because I'm actually working on a book on the theme uh, that you addressed, which is totalitarianism. And uh, so I thought it'd be great to have you on and talk a little bit about 
that talk, but also maybe some of the things that you've uh, learned as you've been thinking about and reading uh, the material that uh, Del, uh, Augusto Del Noche uh, has uh, produced. And uh, based on your talk, I bought his uh, book, the, uh, the Problem of Atheism, which has been recently translated. But anyway, um, why don't you just give us a, a quick snapshot of what you what you talked about, so that our listeners can have a sense of what uh, you know you had to say, or at least in summary, uh, at that at that uh, address and at the Touchstone Conference. Uh, sure. Uh, well, I mean, first of all, I should say you know that was my first experience at a Touchstone. Uh, conference, and I went, um, to be honest, not really knowing a great deal about it, uh, and, you know, as you guys know from your own work, uh, the semester is like a snowball rolling down a hill, and you're always just sort of one step ahead of it, and so, you know, I went uh, uh, to the conference sort of inadequately prepared for what I was going to find there, and I, w I was delighted. It was such a great event, uh, and um, I didn't know what to expect, but I think I was surprised by how much I enjoyed myself. So, you know, shout out to to Touchstone and, and, and to you all. If you were, my sense is that there are many people who go back year after year after year, and I can I can certainly see why. So, you know, I recommend it certainly to, to your listeners. Um, and that you know, and that little stalling gives me time to try and remember what I said. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you know, it's, pretty, really, it's good if you have notes around. <laughs> yeah, when I was there, I mean, the the, the title of 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 um uh, of the talk was uh, the politics of nothingness, um, and the basic idea uh, for which I partially from which I partially drew on on, on Del Noche, but it also just represents um, uh, some currents of thought that I've been working on myself for for, for quite a long time. Um, the, the, the basic idea is that, and I think you can see this empirically in the culture. I think you can see it, um, in everything from, um, uh, Antifa and the riots of 2020 to, uh, the, um, uh, explosive triumph, for lack of a better way of putting it, of the sexual revolution in the form of the transgender revolution, um, but I think you can also see it in the general, uh, empirically in the sort of general despair of the electorate uh, and its loss of faith in our own founding um, myths and, and principles. And the idea is, is that our politics now are dominated by a kind of nihilistic spirit, um, which is um, sourced, I think, um, both to uh, some of the political historical developments that, that Del Noche traces out, um, but also to things that are, are buried deep in the heart of uh, the American experiment uh, and, the, and the logic of the American experiment from the very beginning, a conception of nature that is uh, emptied or evacuated of form, meaning, and fi finality, which leaves it as a kind of plastic receptacle for um, human power uh, uh, in the form of, of, of technology, particularly. Um, a conception of reason that corresponds to that understanding of reality that is primarily pragmatic, uh, instrumental, uh, technical. And the result is, is that, I mean, in, in form, um, that form of reason uh, uh, fits very nicely both with um, Del Noche's understanding of, of a Marxism that has collapsed in on itself on the one hand, mm -hmm. but also with uh, what I would argue is the essentially revolutionary character, um, both of that notion of, of reason itself, but also of American freedom. Um, and they've conspired to sort of initiate if you will, uh, an interminable revolution against basically everything, yeah. uh, uh, all forms of antecedent ultra, uh, uh, antecedent order, be they natural, um, yeah. uh, traditional, cultural, what have you. And so one of the ways that Del Noche describes this is as, a, and, and, and that's a total vision of reality. Right? Yes. I, I, I sometimes joke that, um, you know, with my students that, you know, I want to print out T-shirts that say being is fascist. <laughs> the idea is, but it's only half a joke because the idea uh, it seems right. to me that the idea 
underlying all of the various anti-movements. I mean, it's, and it's interesting how many of our political movements characterize themselves with the prefix anti. Yeah. Um, the presupposition behi- behind all of these is that any form of given order, uh, yeah. any antecedent tradition that defines me prior to my choosing or prior to my acting upon it, um, is oppressive. Yeah. Uh, and, a, and a limitation of, of my freedom. And therefore, being itself, insofar as it has any form, content, and structure, is essentially fascist and has to be overcome or, or, or negated. <laughs> so one of the ways that, Del, that Augusto Donoce describes the, 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 what he calls the condition of total revolution, he, he goes by various names, a condition of total revolution or uh, a totalitarianism of, a, of disintegration, which is not can never find any positive good that it could rest in, right? But in a certain sense, needs uh, uh, something to negate uh, as as fire needs oxygen, you know, which is why, in fact, it needs, you know, fascists hiding behind every bush. Um, right. That this, that, that, that logically speaking, or, or of its inner logic, this movement is a kind of um, revolt against being. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. In the name of a, a, a radical freedom and technological dominance, and and if I may, that that is, I mean, that's a frustration point in in the Protestant world because it actually embraced a lot of that kind of negatively, and there are some of us that are kind of going against that grain that 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 don't want to go down that trail. I mean, I'm, I'm a student of John Webster. You probably knew him well. Um, that was trying to retrieve a, a tradition that didn't go that direction. Um, he, he died too soon, and it really didn't get articulated. But I think you're right on the money in terms of uh, of, of hit, hitting on the point that gets ignored by much of the articul- theological articulation later, that it gets ignored, and therefore it doesn't ever get addressed um, and so maybe, you know, that's a good point. I mean, I think you put it this way. Uh, I have a little article, I think, from First Things. Um, it is the reason itself has been so transformed by the conflation of thought and praxis that transcendent has become, uh, strictly speaking, unthinkable. Um, and, and that's where you're talking about the way reason gets so merged into um, you know, in this tradition into um, this notion of praxis that it becomes indistinguishable. And as sadly, the Protestant world kind of ran with that rather than rebelled against it. And I don't want you to have to have necessarily talk about that end, but it, at least how significant it is politically. Well, I think this ties into some things you had to say about Marxism uh, when you were speaking, but also what I've picked up on in my own reading with, with Del Noche is, the, is you know, we, we've all, uh, you know, those of us who have been introduced to Marx, um, you know, in his philosophy, you know, know that he uh, understands man as homo faber as opposed to homo sapien. Uh, now, what that, I think, uh, is sort of, you know, uh, does in a, in a much more, I think, radical way than I think many people understand or appreciate is that it shifts uh, the not just simply uh, our understanding of human beings, but the very task of philosophy itself from understanding to making. Uh, we, go to, we go to a situation where uh, because uh, there really is nothing to understand, <laughs> we're, we're, we, it's all about us uh, in terms of praxis creating uh, something out of nothing, so to speak. Well, actually, I, I think... The thing that's interesting about it to me is that if it's actually nihilistic, the question becomes, what is it that we're making? And um, I I think I think this is a direction that that Michael was going when you take a look at the sociologist like uh, Philip Reif, uh, where he talks about death works and anti-culture. It's not actually as much about making anything as it is about destroying what's there. I think that's very well said that, I mean, and one of the obvious things that we are in the process of unmaking, uh, it seems to me, is um, the very world that we inhabit in common, that we recognize in our, you know, the world that we drink in with our mother's milk and uh, and back when we say mama, um, uh, that we recognize unreflectively, that is the basis for... um, 
Um, I mean, that, that's the minimal condition for a political society, it seems to me, is that everyone inhabits a recognizably common reality. Um, and it seems to me that it's that unrecognizably or recognizably common reality that we are um, at war with, which mm. means then by extension that, that, that what we're unmaking, Glenn, I think you're exactly right, um, in fact, is our, our, our civilization and, and, and our political society um, rooted in any kind of shared conception of a common good, you yeah. know, and as Thomas Hobbes recognized, you know, where there is no common good, uh, you need a common power, <laughs> uh, to hold men in awe and, and hold things together. And I, you know, I think we are uh, seeing that emerge, um, in a, in, in a kind of post-political form. I mean, there's certainly, you know, the instruments of state have a role to play in it, but, yeah. um, you know the 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 role of, of of a totalitarian state is 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 nothing as compared to to rule by internet. Uh, there, there's a long line of how we in the world we got to this place, right? You know? right. And um, you know, and again, you know, we could spend hours on this, but there are shifts theologically, um, and and we we start to really see it manifest itself in our everyday world more recently, which is strange because this sometimes goes back to 13th, 14th century issues. Um, these are theological shifts, and, and, it, and a lot of it is in, in your work, and I agree a lot of, with, with that work, is that it, it's a loss of Christian notions of transcendence and the way in which that kind of provides the right kind of intelligibility to things. Um, maybe you could hint a little bit about what your work is is doing to kind of address that issue and, um, you know, expose that issue, because I think that's the alternative to the kind of nihilism you've, you're, you're talking about. Sure, although as, as an alternative, it's difficult to know um, uh, whether we could get it back and what that would mean, given yeah. that it's an alternative that's bound yeah. up with... Uh, half a millennium of yeah. scientific and technological development. I mean, you know, sure. the, the, the the curious thing about technological revolution is that it, or, and, and progressive revolution is, is that it is interminable by, by definition. You know, it, yeah. there's, there's, it's, it's like traversing a bad infinite. There's always one more boundary to, or border to, to, to violate or to overcome. And so our audience knows that you've written, you've written on the scientific dimension of that. Uh, and this is something I've always, uh, you know, I even in, in my kind of Protestant world, I've always recommended people read is uh, God, uh, no God, no science. Oh gosh, well, thank you. Um, well, because because you're kind of hit, you're hitting hitting at the ontological roots of of what is that issue there and metaphysical, you know, you know the metaphysical creation and the like because of that. And I do think that's where the war is held. Right. Um, we get a lot of pushback in my own world because of that, but I think that I, I think you've you've kind of honed in on what the issue is. So, right. so maybe that maybe that's the place to kind of to kind of hit. Um, yeah. Well, with, with respect to the to your the question immediately preceding that one, which I'm conscious of not actually having answered. <laughs> uh, you know, if I if I can say this without you know without causing offense in an, an ecumenical setting like this. Yeah. Sure. Um, I increasingly think that in, in, that the most decisive and fateful and tragic event um, in the history of the Christian West is uh, the fracturing of Christian unity. Yeah. Um, uh, and the Reformation is obviously an, an obvious, visible, and institutional manifestation of that. But it's you know there there, there are a lot of currents flowing underneath it. Um, yeah. Because the the fracturing or the, the the breaking apart of the unity of of Christians is not just um, a confessional or, or or institutional event. It goes hand in hand with um, a breaking apart of our cosmology. Yeah. yeah. Right. And the substitution of uh, new conceptions of nature for for old ones. Now, granted. Uh, the new conceptions of nature, you know, the Newtonian and then later the, you know, yeah. the Darwinian and so forth have been remarkably fruitful with respect to the goals that they set for themselves, the analytic and, and exactly. uh, manipulative. I mean, so it's not simply to say that um, you can't simply dismiss those things as 
as as, as false. Um, yeah. And yet, at the same time, it's not clear to me that what was discovered in and through those those um, movements necessitated. In fact, yeah. I'm, I'm actually clear to the contrary. Necessitated the emptying out of the universe of uh, what the antecedent tradition, the Platonic and Aristotelian tradition, had conferred upon it or recognized in it, namely yeah. uh, form, uh, finality. Uh, yeah. inherent uh, meaning, all of which um, the tradition understood to be a consequence and reflection of the fact that the world is created in the Logos. Amen. Right. Yes. So exactly. once you dispense so with we, that, once yes. you dispense yeah. with that, you have to reconceive God in yes. addition right. and along with your reconception of nature. Yeah, I think that this is a theme that we've returned to many times in the show. Uh, so this is something that uh, our listeners who've listened to us for a while are familiar with, this this problem. Um, I guess the thing that many folks wonder about, you know, apart from the theme that you just raised or this issue just raised, which I would, I'd like to get back to, but is uh, how do we reconcile these things? So on the one hand, you know, when we talk about form and uh, finality or form and telos, uh, final causation and so forth, um, you know, I think that that's something that uh, we kind of intuitively get, we almost have to like talk ourselves out of in order to do modern science, <laughs> you know, so it's, it's just kind of something that comes to us quite naturally, but at the same time, um, it's intellectually, uh, kind of your invitation to Siberia. If you say that you believe in, in purpose, <laughs> that in purpose is <laughs> intrinsic to the, to the natural order or something like that. Then, then getting back to this idea, you know, uh, you know, the latest, you know, w- you know, being as being fascist, that would be, <laughs> be you know, is sort of an invitation to being called a fascist. But at, so, but in, in, in of course, we were just with, uh, John West of the discovery Institute. We were talking about te- teleology and, you know, when, when we think about, uh, the intelligent design movement, it's in, in a certain sense in a, an attempt to retrieve teleology uh, with regard to, to nature. But there seems to be, as you noted, uh, some fruitful, uh, you know, sort of things that have come about or some things from fruit that is that we've enjoyed because of our sort of bracketing form and, and uh, final cause, formal cause and final cause, so that we can maybe explore the kind of the well, the material and efficient causes that are at work in the natural order, and uh, and I think a lot of folks wonder how do you how do you hold that all together? How, is it possible to do that? One of the ways I I have played with the idea of putting it together is that if you think about like a game of basketball, okay, when you play basketball, you're doing things with other people you would never do in the course of your daily life. <laughs> you know, you're you're knocking them around, pushing them around. You're trying to knock things out of their hands. You're trying to shoot things anyway, like that. So you're within the lines, and you're engaged in this activity. But once you leave the court, you go back to normal life. Seems to me that science, properly understood, should kind of function in that way. Within the lines, you know, we're going to pretend that. Uh, you know, purpose and form don't matter. We're just going to try to figure out how things function in these other ways or for these other reasons. And then we return to real life eventually. And I think we kind of do that already. Like when we think about ethics and how they relate to the practice of science, uh, if we were just completely devoid of uh, sort of, uh, I guess, ethical awareness, we wouldn't mind uh, you know, asking certain questions or engaging in certain experiments, regardless of what they do to people. So we already kind of restrain ourselves to to some degree. But I don't know if we do any of that in a in a way that's, I guess, satisfying to at least me, uh, because it seems like we kind of live a schizophrenic existence. Yeah, oh, there's a lot there to respond to. Um, <laughs> at least I can make. Uh, weave an intelligible whole out of this. Um, the fact, I mean, I, I, I like your, your, your characterization of, of uh, the game of basketball as an, as an analogy for what we're doing when we're doing science. I'd want to probe that more. And, in, and by, by means of probing it more, uh, I would want to actually um, qualify or, or, or uh, something that you, that you said in the beginning. Right? Because when you're on the game, when you're playing a game between the lines, 
uh, you may be uh, undertaking a, a highly um, stylized and specialized activity with its own rules and ends and so forth, but you don't leave the world to do it. Right? It's not as if you stopped breathing the air that you were breathing before you entered the game or seeing the colors that you saw before entering the game um, and what have you. And it, it seems to me that um, to, to, to probe that aspect of things more deeply might allow us to acquire a, a, a better philosophical self-understanding of what we're doing when we do science and, and the nature of it as a kind of abstraction. Uh, from the fullness or from the whole of reality, which doesn't cease to be real and doesn't cease to be operative simply because we are not at that moment paying attention to it. I'm thinking about somebody like Michael Polanyi was so good uh, in yeah, regard yeah. with his notion of of, of tacit knowledge. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, that's an enormous problem because the very ontology that gives birth to modern science authorizes science, the, the philosophical ontology that with which modern science comes to being warrants science and philosophy going their separate ways yeah um, which means that that uh science tends to be a technologically or, or, or a technically uh highly specialized and complex activity undertaken by people who have virtually no philosophical judgment or self-awareness whatsoever <laughs> <laughs> well, well, well michael i i think that's i think it's one of the profundities of your work it's not an easy read i mean even those those of us disposed to aquinas and and the metaphysical traditions it's not an easy read because you, you got to balance a lot of things um but i i think honing in on the fact that a lot of the way the discussion the discussions occur uh, are are have rid themselves of classical Christian ontology, metaphysics, and theology, and I think that's what you really bring into the forefront. The way that you can't proceed with these things without these things, and and have an intelligible and and uh, fulfilling um, interpretation of them. Uh, is exactly the point, and, and maybe that's that's the place to talk about these things because, um, it, you know, I mean, I would say it as a Christian, of course, you know, the, the Trinitarian perfections of God and all things related to God um, have to be at the forefront. Um, but but bracket that out, you 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 can't. You, well, you really can't bracket it out. <laughs> that's the point, <laughs> right? Um, but but the point but the point that um, a creation isn't intelligible and pure. Um, and needs that further intelligibility to give sense to what it is and why it is, um, is exactly what you're on to. Well, and I, th I think the point that has to be shown is, you know, if you can't bracket that out, yeah, that means you don't actually bracket it out. You're deceived about what you think you're doing. So I, I forget which one of you it was that said earlier, you know, that the idea of, of, of bringing purpose in, um, yeah. Uh, will we'll, we'll get you exiled to intellectual Siberia. Um, <laughs> I would want to flip that around and say purpose is already there. It's inherent in your very act of – you never do without it on either the side of the subject or the object. You believe in it too. You just don't know yourself well enough to know yeah. that, in fact, in thinking, um, uh, you're presupposing this on – both sides of the subject-object divide, in the act of thinking and of your object, because they wouldn't be holes distinguishable from other holes um, of, of various kinds if you didn't assume they had a form of some kind. So, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty hard, actually, not to be some kind of Platonist. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Or if or if you if you, if you try to be, you become kind of absurd. Like like yeah. if, for example, uh, I've come across something that is referred to uh, as healthism. In other mm -hmm. words, the idea that we have this idea of health, and that's oppressive to unhealthy people. <laughs> in other words, in other words, in order to have an, a notion of health, you have to have ends and you have to have form in order for it to be intelligible. And that's precisely what offends some uh, advocates of, uh, I guess, unhealthy or, you know, forget when you, get to, when you talk about uh, obesity, you know, and sort of uh, fat shaming. So it's you know, this, this stuff that, that now is, uh, you know, so now we, we're subject to like um, 
you know, overweight women in the uh, swimsuit issue of uh, Sports Illustrated. <laughs> because the, it, in other words, if we didn't have uh, overweight women in there, it would be, uh, you know, uh, an, an oppressive to, to women who are overweight. Um, but what what's implied, of course, is that that there's no, I guess, moral or even aesthetic or uh, just simple goodness to being uh, physically, well, to not being obese. <laughs> right, <laughs> you know, right. Right. Well, but what you're pointing to is something really, really deep and basic and just in our, our capacity to make any kinds of distinctions at all, or even cognize things of, of, of different kinds. You know, I've, I've, I've joked with some friends of mine, half joked, because I'd actually kind of like to do this, to write an article that the war on pronouns doesn't go far enough because it leaves other parts of speech intact. Right? I mean, <laughs> direct objects are so objectifying. <laughs> the prepositions like of, you know, genitive are, you know, they're, they're possessive or, 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 or there are all kinds of problems with, with right. the parts of speech. And then when I mentioned this to one of my friends, he reminded me that Nietzsche said, we haven't gotten rid of God because we haven't gotten rid of grammar. Yeah. Oh, wow. And, and, you know, there's something really uh, profound in that. The, the, yeah. the, 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 the very structure of our syntax speaks of intelligible order. Right. And, you know, the only way to get outside of that is to just, um, I mean, I don't know, man, maybe this is the ideal, to just sort of stare gaping, you know, thoughtlessly in front of a screen as a, as a stream of disconnected images pass by, you know, while we're, you know, uh, um sedated or something i don't i don't know but but it, it, short of that you know it, it it's pretty hard to to um annihilate um reality as thoroughly as as you know some of our folks would like to well it's it's on, it's on that point that you know maybe bringing up something from your lecture in the tough stone where you talk about evil and private you know you know the way in privation of evil um in in, in the fact that and this is something we wrestle with in our own our own denomination, you know, um, the, the fact that we, we, we like to talk a lot about total, you know, incapacitation, but the sad part is that we often ignore that God sustains being with, with, within that incapacitation. And we don't know how to work out that dialectic, but you hint on the way in which, you know, kind of evil and falsehood as part of privation um, are the negation of being, and yet God is the cause of all the good of being. And this very abstract stuff from a lot of our world. But may, maybe you can hit on that, because I, th I think this is what a lot of classical theologians from Augustine to Aquinas really were trying to work out for us. And it's a gift to us that we shouldn't ignore. That, And this is actually something I think, from, from what I hear you talking about, is actually gives us a, an alternative set of resources to work through when we understand this to actually engage what we're dealing with in in the currents. This notion that, you know, the negation of being, um, the fact that nihilism has some kind of ontology maybe, and and that um, that the kind of uh, you know the privative notion of trying to undermine everything that God has worked through in terms of an ontological and teleolord teleological order has been about. Yeah. Are, are you, are you speaking out of the reform tradition? Right. Well, I, 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 somewhat, but, but in a very wide reform. Tradition. Okay. Okay. My, my, reform, my reform, reform friends always tell me that I don't adequately understand total depravity. So, no, uh, I, you know, I don't want to impute to, yeah, yeah. to um, no, I'm, not that, I'm not that radical, but, but yeah. if you want to address it from that angle, we have fans that would appreciate it. Oh, well, I thought you're, I thought that was the language you were invoking there for a moment. Yeah. 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 But, but the classic principle though, and it, it it's, it's, it's not just a matter of faith; it's also a matter of of, of, of logic, and, yeah. and and what it and what the what the notion of privation means, yeah. um, and and you know this is as clear as day and and pervasive throughout the thought of Saint Augustine, right? To say that evil is parasitic, that it's some kind of lack, is always to say that good is more basic and fundamental. Yes, right. So, yeah. um. And, and, and 
it has to be. Otherwise, evil ceases to even make sense as evil. It's only because one, because there is a vestige of, or because good is more basic, that we can even recognize evil. Eliminate the good, and you've eliminated evil as well. And, and you and you run evil back up into God, which is a sinister side of some traditions I've read. Right, right, and that's a whole. That, that's a yeah. well. Actually, you yeah. do run evil back up into God, but at, what you really ultimately do is 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 eliminate the distinction. So yes, they're, they're, they're neither good nor evil. No, your yeah. point then about about um, you know, traditionally speaking, of course, um, being um, goodness, uh, truth are all convertible notions. I mean, being yeah. is good, and and it's truly good, and it's true, uh, and, yeah. and 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 so on and so forth. And it seems to me that whatever one's interpretation of of whether you know whether I have the doctrine of total depravity right yeah. or not, yeah. um, it can't be such that it eliminates that. Yes, exact, exactamente, as my Latin family says. <laughs> or if it, if it does, what you've actually done is, is you've turned being into a completely emptiless, meaningless sort of yes. facticity yes. And, and really ha then handed it over uh, to all of the uh, uh, pathologies um, intellectual pathologies that we've been talking about. And sh should I say, and and I don't want to cut this up, but would it not have lent itself towards the same nihilisms you're talking about? Yeah, and in fact, you know, in, in some ways I think, um, you know, the precondition, the deep preconditions, historically and conceptually, for the kinds of nihilism that we're talking about is just this sort of evacuation. Now, whether you yeah. want to locate that in, um, some strands of reformed theology, which you know, I'm I'm, I'm hesitant to do, at least on this show. <laughs> um, well, 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 I, I can say, as a reformed person, there are some strands that do. Yeah, yeah. But I think there are some strands that don't need to do it. Yeah, and, oh, and that's kind of the, that's the kind of pivot line that I I, I was kind of a, a trying right. to. Right. Or, or whether you want to really locate it in, in, or whether you want it located in the the kind of natural theologies of the 17th century, you know the. The, the Newtonian yeah. priority of force over form yeah. or yeah. or the Baconian conception of, 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 of the unity of knowledge and power. I mean, I think there are, are sources outside of what we narrowly think of as the um, uh, the, the theological tradition, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. that are nevertheless theological, uh, yeah. that have a, an enormous role in laying the foundation for this and, you know, with respect to Chris's question earlier about about Del Noche going way back now, yeah, um, you know one of the things I've said I don't recall whether I say it in that uh, Touchstone talk or not, but I, I wrote that talk uh, very shortly after finishing up for First Things a review of the book that you're reading um, uh, on atheism, and you know one of the, the the points that I make is that I think Del Noche has the essence of our. Uh, uh, of our situation down better than the causes. Um, that I think uh, the, the Anglo-American path um, uh, that leads from, you know, Bacon and Locke through to um, uh, Jefferson and on to later to, to, pra to pragmatism and progressivism um, is just as successful and perhaps in some ways maybe more so because it's not got, you know, Hegel as its uh, 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 deep root, more successful in evacuating um, uh, the, the world of, of, of meaning and absolutizing power, etc. And um, you, know, you can see this in, you know, if you look at someone like um, uh, John Locke, and you read the first, um, uh, the introduction to his um, uh, essay concerning human understanding, and, you know, he, he, he wants to define uh, reason in such a way, uh, to limit it in such a way that God falls completely outside of it. Such that yeah. really to limit what we can intelligibly and meaningfully talk about and think about. Yeah. Now, this goes back to your point before about, you know, the, the, the highly circumscribed nature of American reason for which yeah. uh, there is no such thing as a profound question. <laughs> well, but just, so, just problem. But with that, Michael, I mean, I, I, and I think maybe our audience may may not follow fully. Yeah, yeah. I'm all, but, maybe, but maybe here's a point that at which they will. Um, 
there tends to be even even in our world, you know, this kind of embrace of a kind of libertarianism that I think is unhealthy and unchristian, and it, it, it has to do with the you know the unpremised nature. And I don't know if everybody would get what I mean by that of of the will and freedom. And it's the way that it's unshaped that somehow it spontaneously generates a world. Um, that it imposes on the world. I mean, like, and, and you know, I, I know it's in my tradition because I'm in my tradition. There, there is this notion of voluntarism, you know, that imposes the divine will on reality. And therefore, all of a sudden, we become a second step in that as creatures. And that way of reading reality is that we become the determiners of the shape of reality in the form of our will. Um, and I think radically that's, that is, this is something my own work has done and I've got a lot of pushback in my own tradition, but my, you know, my own work has done is that that is not classically Christian. <laughs> it's fundamentally not classically Christian, that there is, there is a way in which our will is always formed and premised. And that, that when Chris does his work on family and Glenn does his work on spiritual formation, those have to do with the ontological shaping of a reality prior to our will. Yeah, and the classic way of expressing that, of course, is that the, the will has an involuntary, as it were, inclination, an inclination that we don't choose, an ordination that we don't choose yes. for the good. Yes. But we desire, and, and what's interesting is, is that if it, in that structure, Right, the primary act of the will um, is not uh, to impose or to affect or even to choose. Um, it's to desire. It's to love. Right, and, and, the, and the reason, Mike, if I will, that we tend to get it wrong is because we tend to think in my own tradition competitively. And when we we stop to think of it competitively, and we see that is the kind of enactment of what it means to be a creature that changes a lot and i don't think we fully get it yeah i think this is to kind of step it step back a little bit and put this within a framework that people might be more i guess familiar with um oftentimes when people think of reason not just reformed people but just generally modern people uh they think of instrumentalist sort of under ways of of doing reason or, or sort of uh, reasoning rather than what people in the past uh, were able to consider, which would be what contemplation was for. Yeah. So, you know, the difference between ratio and uh, intellectus. So intellectus is, is beholding, you know, is, is sort of receiving uh, and uh, ratio is sort of discursive knowledge. What are you going to do with it? <laughs> but now uh, that the, this idea that, uh, reason is only what you do is, uh, is sort of impose, you know, it, it gets us into this position of kind of imposing reason on kind of a reasonless world. Uh, so, you know, uh, like when IBM uh, had a series of commercials here not too long ago uh, about a smarter planet. The impl the imp it was what was implied is that the planet is kind of stupid. <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of dumb, and we need to bring reason to it. Reason is something that we bring to reality, um, and within the Reformed tradition, this is you know sort of the idea is that we bring God's law to reality rather than there being a natural law that kind of is already present that we recognize. Now, you know, Calvin uh, stated that. You know, uh, the positive law, the Mosaic law, is actually a summary of the natural law. But it's a, it's remarkable how many Reformed people don't know that. <laughs> that, that they kind of think it's something that we have to bring to reality. He's kind of echoing scholasticism there. Um, yeah. The, 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 what was interesting, I think, Chris, about what you just said, or part of a lot of it was interesting, um, but the thing that I zeroed in on is, is that, uh, and this allows us maybe to tie some things together, um, is that the reason that you're describing, right, that imposes itself on, on uh, reality? Mm. It, my argument is, is that it's essentially, for lack of a better way of putting it, technical in nature. You described it as instrumental. Uh, I described it as technical. And what do I mean by that? Well, how do you know, um, for example, in science, um, 
when your theory is quote unquote true, <laughs> right? When your experiments work, right? In other words, when I have succeeded in either um, manipulating a phenomenon uh, in accordance with my theory or predicting its course of sequence of cause and effects or, or inhibiting it in some way, um, these are all forms of control. Yeah. So truth itself then becomes a matter of um, of control or power. This is, I think, what Francis Bacon meant when he said that truth and usefulness come to the same thing, or when he meant that knowledge and power come to the same thing. It's it's when I, through this this um, conjoining of knowledge and practice, um, it's when I um, have succeeded in realizing um, what was heretofore only possible. So, so truth is now no longer what is in the old sense. It's what's possible, right? Um, but of course, how do you how do you um, realize what the, the 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 limits of possibility are? How do you how do you discover what is possible by transgressing the limit of what is presently possible? Right. So right. this starts then the the yeah. the, the revolution. Uh, I, I find the epistemology of our current world rather baffling in a lot of ways. Um, and I think it's because there is a, there's a complete breakdown of metaphysics and ontology. Because if you don't have those in place, you don't you don't even know what epistemology is for. If you don't know what's real, you don't know what can be known. Um, so so you have with the transgender movement, you have this idea that what I am is not objective. It is not verifiable. It is purely subjective, and the only way you can know it is if I reveal it to you. You know, so there's this sort of Gnosticism that's involved there. On the other hand, you have science, uh, which we are constantly uh, taught here about settled science, which is itself a contradiction. Right. Um, but th there's this this uh, feeling of absolute certainty about scientific findings somehow. And yet, going to something we talked about before, there's a rejection of teleology because it cannot be verified scientifically. So that is an area that is excluded from the possibility of knowledge. But we have epistemic humility in, in the question of whether I'm male or female, with or without my beard. <laughs> so we have, we have epistemic humility at that level, but we don't carry that over to say, you know, we can't examine final causes using science maybe we should have epistemic humility about final causes in teleology. The, the whole system is incredibly incoherent. And again, I think it goes back to the utter breakdown in metaphysics and ontology. Right. But coherence only matters if you're, or if you're under some kind of obligation or interested in discovering what's true. Well, well, your, that, you know, well, that was always my critique of, of presuppositionalism. Anyway, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I'm just going to summarize this with a bumper sticker slogan I read a long time ago. Nature bats last. <laughs> <laughs> Soon, sooner or later, your, nature bats last and it's a slugger. I mean, you know, you, the, the whole problem with this system on, you know, not on a philosophical level, but on, a, on sort of a personal level is it's destroying lives. Of course, and they don't know it yeah. yet. Yeah, yeah. No, when the when the receipts come due for this science experiment, um, of course, everyone who's conducted it will be gone. There'll be nobody that can be held responsible for it. But uh, and they're starting to. You know, it's it's interesting. I mean, I'm speaking here particularly of the of, of the transgender thing, which you mentioned. I mean, we're now beginning to see uh, uh, people who were realized they were done, done wrong by, by, you know, the authority of, of, of science. And I hope there's, there's some recourse for that. But of course, you know, what we're involved in here, you know, backing out from that to a, a, a much broader scale is the idea that if, you know, if knowledge is essentially the conquest of nature, you know, we think we can bat last. And yeah. science is the quest to, to rearrange the lineup. <laughs> um, uh, and, and, that's um, yeah. that remains to be seen. I'm, I, I like you. I'm highly skeptical. Now, here, here, here's an interesting thing: the word science, um, the, the Latin scantia, uh, where we get the word from, originally meant any field of knowledge that had a methodology for for learning it. Okay, the word gets restricted. As near as I can tell, in the early 19th century, maybe late 18th, but probably early 19th century, to 
the natural sciences, knowledge about the natural world. That, it seems to me, is based on a metaphysical assumption that the only thing to be known is the natural world. Nothing else qualifies as knowledge. Uh, and that very change in the meaning of the word points to what I think they would say is the settled question of meta metaphysics. All that exists is matter and energy, period. Right. So, right. It, which, which is an incredibly anemic kind of answer to the issues that metaphysics raises, but it's the one that they accepted. And once you start approaching knowledge that way, it inevitably shapes your metaphysical views, whether you start there or not. Th knowledge is your route into metaphysics. So if you define knowledge in that way, upper and lower story thinking or fact value distinction, however you want to talk about it, if you define knowledge in that way, it presupposes and forces you into a particular kind of, I would argue, almost an anti-metaphysical system. I think that, that that's a key part of all of this, too. I think you're absolutely right. Um, and But it's, it's, it's curious the way um, uh, the anti-metaphysical system works, because it's not just what you have left over at the end when you finally get around to doing metaphysical thinking. It's what shows itself to have been operating in your thought without your articulating it all along. And right. one example of that is, is is contained in what you just said. I mean, um, I forget exactly how you said it, but you said, you know, the idea, the, the restriction of the meaning of science in the 19th century meant that, uh, you know, the knowledge of nature or, or nature is the object of knowing is all there is. But of course, um, it's not just that, is it? It's a very stylized and reductive sense of nature. So it's a right. vision of knowledge that has defined and that has determined in advance. It's matter and energy. What what there is to be known, right? right? And so there are judgments, you know, about the ultimate nature of things that you can't get away from, um, yeah. that are operating here all along. And yet these particular judgments um, are falsified by life as lived and by the fact that we never in fact see matter and energy we see the world and we abstract notions of matter and energy from that whole well i would i would argue that it's contradicted by the very fact that you're thinking it yeah yeah thought itself yeah it doesn't fit into the paradigm yeah hans jonas has i don't know if you all know his thought uh yeah, yeah. He's, he's one of the most important and undervalued philosophers of the 20th century but he has this great line noticing this very fact that that a reductive science like this necessarily involves uh, a science the science the reductive scientist beating retreat to an archimedean point outside of nature where he's re exempt from his reduction so right ideas are just matter in motion or matter and energy, but not these ideas in the moment that I'm trying to convince you that they're true. Right. Uh, and he yeah. says, you know, it's the Cretan declaring all Cretans to be liars. <laughs> <laughs> I do think we, we should probably wrap it up here. And I know you obviously have other things to do. <laughs> but uh, is there anything you want to say as we do wrap up, uh, you know, just kind of leave us, leave our audience with? Well, I mean, Certainly, I've enjoyed myself tremendously. I hope uh, this, the conversation we ended up having and the one we talked about having beforehand <laughs> didn't exactly uh, uh, line up, although, of course, they're related. I hope, I hope what it shows um, is that there are deep, deep um, metaphysical and theological considerations lying below the surface of our ordinary social and political problems. And lying beneath the surface of the things we take for granted. You know, one of the most important, I think, little books, uh, and I'm sure you assign it to your students um, and have probably read it many, many times, um, is uh, C.S. Lewis's The Abolition of Man. Yeah. I absolutely love it. Um, and part of what is so ingenious about it, it seems to me, um, is that a book that ends with, you know, a foreboding, and it turns out quite prophetic, um, uh, grasp of our brave new world. You know, it's just what, right. what happens to a society uh, that is organized around the attempt to conquer and remake nature and itself. That a book that ends with that uh, begins with a very simple reflection on flaws in education and the way that those flaws in education rob us of our ability to see. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. so much of, I think, uh, what we're talking about and so much of, you know, the question that Tom raised earlier about, about 
you know, profound questions and so forth. Um, we inhabit forms of reason. We inhabit a, a, a basic conception of reality that has deprived us of our ability to see. Uh, and we therefore don't grasp the gravity and the meaning of our actions. Right. And if there were one thing that I would want to insist on in leaving is that is, is holding those two things together and recognizing that if we want uh, to escape or transcend or endure, um, what looks to be a fairly fairly hellish uh, uh, <laughs> period of of total revolution. Um, <laughs> Uh, the way we need to do that is is, is to return our, our return, to turn within and recover the eyes that we've lost. Right. Um, and so th that would be my you know part, I don't know if it's wisdom or not, but that would be my parting word. <laughs> well, this, that's 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 great. That's a great thought to depart with. Uh, if we have folks, and I'm sure we do, who'd like to learn more about your work, uh, maybe learn more about your your books, uh, where should they go? Well, uh, I suppose for books, Amazon, um, uh, and everywhere else, Google. <laughs> you know, I, I, most of a lot of the things that I've written, you know, for for first things or other journals are are online. Uh, those who are really interested and who and would like to, you know, think in this vein, are certainly welcome to consider coming to study with us. It's a fantastic place to uh, at the John Paul II Institute in Washington. I have some colleagues who are just absolutely. Uh, wonderful and profound people, and you can you know you can make a life of thinking like this. But um, do, you, do you have online programs? Or we, no? we, we are in person. We you know we're we're, we're uh, kind of a lot better, of it's better. It's better. We don't that's, think that uh, that, yeah. that that online programs can substitute for the real thing. Excellent. No, no, good, very um, good. I appreciate that. But you know, I, I, we would welcome uh, that uh, those kinds of inquiries. But yeah, I mean. Um, my stuff is out there. Uh, a couple of books, and hopefully a, a, another one in the next in, within the next year, and um, uh, certainly a number of articles that can be accessed uh, various via various websites. Yeah, we should probably wrap up here, Tom. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I know, I know, you, I know you, 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 you and Michael probably could go on for hours and hours. I mean, we, we would enjoy, we'd enjoy it, but uh, anyway, I'll call him later. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway, well, thank you very much, uh, Doctor Hamby. It's been great to have you on the show, and, and we will have have you back sometime. If, I if really enjoyed it. Well, I'd be happy to come back and have the conversation that you uh, that you intended to have. And uh, <laughs> by, by the way, by the way, this happens all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and like I say, you can choose you can, you can choose your best hour. Um, <laughs> welcome to the podcast that never stays on yeah, top. Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, let, let's let's wrap it up there. Thank you for listening to the Theology Podcast. It's great to have had you with us for another show, and you've made it all the way to the end. If you'd like to learn more about. Uh, the Theology Podcast. Obviously, we have a website, but if you'd like to support uh, our work, we appreciate that too. We, uh, we even have a Patreon page, and we appreciate all the folks who give to us to help us off our address or to underwrite the cost of the show. But anyway, that's enough for now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.